So uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Fedor Picus, and I'll be talking about the profiling of uh, concurrent programs, specifically memory the performance visualization of concurrent programs. Uh, speaking of uh, waking them up, if you are still not awake after Herb's wonderful performance, uh, remember that if you don't ask questions, I'll start asking questions. Uh, that's how I know if you are uh, paying attention or sleeping. Um, so uh, I'll talk about how to get the detailed and useful profile in the form of timeline of events in a concurrent program, what happened uh, before and after and during something else was happening. Uh, we'll have some hopefully useful uh, techniques for concurrent programming and uh, there will be some code that I had to simplify to fit on the slides. There will be some code that actually is that simple as it will be on the slides. Uh, so there are some kind of general uh, assumptions uh, specific for this talk. They can be extended probably, but uh, that's what I uh, used for, uh, <coughs> for preparing the system. So uh, I program on Linux. Uh, I also use some other Unixes. Uh, pretty much everything that I'm talking about will work on any modern version of uh, Linux or Unix. I, uh, as far as I know, yes. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, repeat the question. Yeah, the question was if Mac is Unix, a BSD core, uh, as far as I know, everything that uh, I'm talking about is supported on BSD. There may be slight variations in system function calls, but as far as I know, everything is supported on BSD. I don't know if Mac actually disabled any BSD features, uh, but uh, as far as like the standard BSD should be supported. 64-bit address space. If you have to work on 32-bit address space, uh, there are some things you can do, but you have some clever code to, to work through. Uh, and I only tested x86 hardware, uh, and uh, actually I, I tested on PowerPC hardware uh, <coughs> a bit, uh, so other platforms may add some uh, wrinkles that I didn't know about. Uh, okay, as far as uh, uh, me asking questions, how many people ha attended Herb's talk on Monday? On, yeah, almost everybody. Okay, so this will be easy for you. Uh, so uh, why do we measure performance in the first place and profile it? Well, uh, C++ is a performance-oriented language. If you're using C++, odds are pretty good that you're interested in performance of your programs uh, now, even if you're interested in performance of your programs, programmers are pretty bad at making guesses about how the program will perform or why it's performing the way it is. Uh, that's why measurements are important. And for concurrent programs, it's even worse because they depend on more subtle details and more of details of more of other things like libraries and hardware uh, and uh, the day of the week and uh, things like that. Uh, programmers are even worse at guessing why their concurrent programs behave the way they do. Now why, okay, if the concurrent programs are so bad, why bother writing concurrent programs? You have seen these slides many times, which is why I kind of made a small copy of it basically. Single CPU cores are not getting much faster anymore. The CPUs themselves are getting bigger and bigger, but where that transistor count goes, mostly in various concurrent hardware. Caches, cache coherency units, um, some of it into vector units, supporting multiple cores, instruction decoders, uh, other stuff that is basically can only be used if you're writing concurrent programs. Again, uh, we are C++ people, we are interested in performance, that's the way you get performance from uh, modern processors. Okay, how do you profile a concurrent program? Well, there are profilers, and most of them work on concurrent programs. Some, some don't, but you know, the Google Profiler, VTune, they all work and do their thing. Uh, and all of them are useful. If you have a good enough profile, many problems in concurrent programs as well as non-concurrent become obvious. 
there is a key problem that you don't have to face in serial programs. In serial programs, if you know where your time is spent, you, uh, you basically know everything. The, do the order of execution may be data dependent, of course, but well, you can print the log, you can reason from the data, <coughs> uh, you know what, to what took so long. In concurrent programs, you may be confronted with weird situations where nothing seems to be taking particularly long, but the program isn't performing well. So here are three examples I actually observed on, uh, on, on the application I work on. So these are, the, 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 these started as like three subsets of the program I was working with. The first program, uh, on one thread, uh, it runs at 100% CPU load, one, one second real time, one second CPU time. Uh, on two threads, uh, well, that's pretty good. Real time dropped for the same workload, real time dropped almost by half, CPU time went a little bit up, there is some overhead. On four threads, real time is almost back where we started. CPU time is going up, and I go all the way to 64 threads. I have actually 64 cores, so the, there is no contention here. Uh, real time is way higher than it was for a serial program. CPU time is even higher. Uh, the second program basically shows uh, that uh, adding threads doesn't help at all. Doesn't hurt, but doesn't help either. And the third program uh, shows that uh, adding threads uh, basically keeps the uh, electric bills high because uh, power is being consumed, CPUs are getting used, but the real time doesn't go down. Okay, so let's look at our first program. The first program started to scale, then stopped, and actually went into uh, extreme negative scaling. Any guesses what was happening here? Yes, exactly. So if we had a timeline, and this is how the timeline would look like, so uh, time goes left to right, and this bar represents our unit of computation on one thread. On two threads, uh, two bars going on at the same time, almost half, as, just a little over than half short. On four threads, we start seeing waiting on logs on all four threads, and on 64 threads, this is just one of them, we uh, spent all of our time waiting on logs, basically. Uh, yes, that is the symptom of extreme log contention. Sorry? That implies that it's a spin log, right? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, so that's kind of a tricky question that, uh, uh, boils down to what's CPU time. If you, uh, if you use spin lock, yes, it's pure busy waiting, it just spins CPU over and over. If you use mutexes, you're supposed to go to sleep. Try heavily contended on the mutex, sometimes it works, sometimes you see all your time show up as a system time. So this was actually observed on a mutex, and uh, uh, yes, I didn't tell you that the CPU time, which I measure as, like, I, I just give it to you as a single CPU time. If, if I broke it down between user time and system time, you would see that most of it is system time. But the CPU, is still spun up. CPU is still spun up, so uh, it's just doing not your work, it's doing whatever OS is doing when it's try desperately trying to figure out which thread do I wake up uh, n now, and this happens uh, like you know, 100 million times a second. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, 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 this was one of the programs. This is the kind of information we want to get. So it's kind of sticking a microscope into your threads. You know, we like abbreviations, so what should we call it thread scope? Uh, what we want to know is basically what the thread did, how long did it take, what was happening while that was happening, what, ha what happened before and after, uh, uh, if we waited on a log for how long, who was holding the lock while we were waiting, how many threads were contending on the lock, if you're practicing lock-free programming, how many threads were contending on atomics, and uh, visualizing it in the form of timeline just makes it so much easier to see what the problem is compared to printing a lot of numbers in table. Uh, so let's look at our second uh, program. 
Here, basically, we add threads and uh, nothing happens. So what's going on here? Uh, one option is single thread, and that would be correct. Uh, the, uh, so that's not the one I'm going to show, and that's not the one that happened, but th that's a possible option. Uh, anything else could be happening. Single lock, serial lock, single thread. Exactly. The, uh, there are probably other ways to get this, but this is the one that, as I said, this is from an actual pro program. So this is, this is what actually happened. So when you see a picture like this, you immediately go, ah, complete serialization. Uh, for some reason, each thread has to wait on the results of the previous thread to complete, and then it starts doing its part. Okay, and the third program is uh, real time stays the same, CPU time steadily goes up. What could be going on here? <coughs> Any guesses? Okay, let me show the timeline then. Timeline for one thread is obvious. Timeline for two threads. Both threads are concurrently running. There are no locks. Uh, the same operation takes twice as long. Four threads are concurrently running, no locks. Uh, the same amount of useful computation. Uh, they are in the same data set, yes. No, the, no, 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 there is no stupid mistake like that. So the question was <laughs> whether they're just redoing the same thing over and over. No, they're actually doing, so for example, let's say if this was sort, one of them is sorting the first half and the second is sorting the other half. Well, of course, and sort doesn't scale perfectly. You have to sort the whole thing after you sort half and half, but uh, kind of that's the idea. Or if you're looking for prime numbers, one of them is looking for you know, all prime numbers uh, like in the first half of the array, the second one is looking for all prime numbers in the second half of the array, something like that. So uh, they are doing different things, but that's what they're doing. No locks. Locks would show up as the, those orange blobs. So what's going on? False sharing. Uh, false sharing is po it's close. Uh, it, and it could be responsible for this. In this case, it wasn't. Uh, they really were working on different sets of the same data set, but you're getting close, so false sharing, almost there. Sorry? Uh, not quite close, almost there. Sorry? No, no disk I.O. in this case. Uh, there, it's just computing. Memory bandwidth limitation. Yes, memory bandwidth limitation. So uh, what's going on? Yep, it's a memory bound program. Now, how can it be? How can uh, a program be so memory bound that this is what you get? Well, uh, let's not guess about performance. Let's measure what the memory bandwidth is. Here is, I'm sure you've seen this plot many times, memory bandwidths on uh, one. Uh, do we have a pointer of, of sort? Uh, no pointer? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll wave my hand. So uh, on, the, on, on the horizontal axis is the size of the memory, uh, the cl classic way of, me of measuring the memory bandwidth. We'll be writing a memory block into me over and over. Uh, now, oh, thank you. Okay, so memory size, uh, bandwidth, for small memory sizes, we're sitting in an L1 cache, huge bandwidth, then we drop to L2 cache, L3 cache, and that's the main memory. Uh, now, I w uh, why does it say here 256 bit? Well, uh, because it was 256 bit, I was using SSE instructions to copy memory. I, I really tried to saturate the memory bus. I wanted to see what the memory bandwidth is. Now, this is one thread running on one core. This is two and four threads, same thing. So while we're in L1 cache for four threads, there is a lot of noise. Maybe I didn't run it long enough, but basically L1 cache stays L1 cache. Yep, there is one per core. Uh, L2 cache for two threads, they're, they're shared between two cores. So uh, for four threads, we kind of drop down. L3 cache, there is only one. This, this is where we hit the main memory. This is per core. Okay, this is per core, but we, do, we have four cores, so we do more work. Let's multiply the middle curve by two and the last curve by four. And I, I scaled, I kind of cut down on the plot. So this is the total memory uh, bandwidth on one thread for, for, for all cores, meaning one core. This is for two threads. 
and the sa basically the same is for four threads. Two cores fully saturated the memory. Now, this is an extreme memory-bound program because I tried to be as memory-bound as possible, but apparently the little computational fragment that I was showing you before was pretty close. It was strongly memory-bound. So you actually don't have uh, that much uh, <coughs> spare memory bandwidth in concurrent programs. OK, uh, uh, bonus example I just, oh, question, sorry. Go. Shouldn't, shouldn't you have seen a small difference in execution time between one thread and two threads since there was some spare memory uh, I should have, okay, so yes, question. Uh, the, the one core doesn't quite saturate the memory bandwidth. Uh, as I said, this was cut out from a real program. So the, basically, this was a task that was going on on one or two or four threads, and the same task was going on at the same time on another one or two or four threads. So they were already contending pretty heavily. If you did it in isolation, you would see a small, uh, my, my previous chart shows that the, the aggregate memory bandwidth for two cores is not, not quite 2x of one core, but uh, like one and a half x, some, something like that. So yes, if I did it in, in, purely, if nothing else was going on and contending for memory, saturating the memory bus also, I would have seen a slight spike, a slight improvement, and then go back down. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this is this is how memory now also remember this was done on uh, this is done on purely uh, like using non-atomic operations. If you sprinkle in atomic operations, your contention becomes worse. So now we we start hitting false sharing. <coughs> well, it's true sharing in this case, but it has the same effect as the false sharing. Uh, so. Uh, those of you who attended Herb's talk have seen his bonus example. Remember the bonus example? Yep. Uh, uh, slides are produced uh, thanks to Herb. Uh, low lock uh, Q was producer and consumer threads. That's uh, from Herb's slide. Uh, so what Herb had is basically a, a low log Q. Uh, the, so I, I'm not going to, uh, most of you were there. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it. Basically, the point is that these are, what are these? These are consumers, and this is the critical section for the consumers. And uh, th these are producers. They also have their own critical section. And what Herb found out, uh, that uh, his initial implementation, which is the one I've shown you, yielded negative scaling. Two consumer threads made, made it worse than one, and producer threads, two producer threads were better, but three already were worse. And after uh, some experimentation, what he discovered was that uh, the consumer lock was the main problem and the producer lock was the second problem. Specifically, doing a lot of work inside the critical section was the problem. Now, I'm sure you've all seen a lot of work inside the critical section here. Uh, for those who didn't, let me highlight it. This is consumer. This is the work. This is copying, uh, this is copying the data. This is producer. This is the work. This is uh, pruning uh, deleted uh, nodes from the queue. Again, all the work is inside critical section. I haven't had time to actually convert the slides to Herb slides to code, but this is my best guess at how the timeline would look like. Consumer starts consuming. Within the task of consuming, we can ask questions. Okay, what was it? This is overall big task. What was it doing as subtasks? So it was most, mostly copying. That's fine. This, but while it was copying, another consumer thread couldn't do anything. It was waiting on a spin lock. Then it had to do its own copying. And while it was doing copying, the first consumer thread had to wait on a lock. Um, we can be pretty confident in that, of that because once Herb moved the copying out of the spin lock, uh, things went much faster. How did the producer look like? Well, uh, probably the same. Not all producers do the cleanup of a uh, trimmed node, but once somebody does, this one uh, hits the cleanup. Everybody else who is running at the same time has to wait on a lock. Uh, again, uh, uh, once uh, cleanup of the, of the removed nodes was removed from this critical section, things went much better. So th the timelines like this make a lot of problems obvious. 
Now, uh, I've, I've shown you four different types of uh, problems with concurrent pro programs. A memory contention, doing too much work in critical section, log contention, uh, and serialization. Who had at least one in their practical work? Who had all four? Okay. Not all problems are obvious. Memory contention, for example, is not directly visible. You have to learn to interpret the timelines. Uh, once you do, uh, becomes useful. Okay. So hopefully I convinced you that it would be nice if we had these timelines. Well, how do we get them? Uh, the, there are some profilers that give you something similar. Uh, the, uh, they don't know what's interesting for you, so they tend to collect a lot of data, or they collect not enough data. Now, they can be very useful in, a, in determining where approximately your, your problem lies, so then you can go in and instrument the problem to collect just the data you need. What's the problem with collecting too much data? In addition to it takes a long time, it also takes, it's hard to read, it takes a, a long time for you to figure out, to sift through that data, even if it's in the form of timeline. You know, if you have a timeline with a granularity of one microsecond and your program is 10 hours, well, you can't look at every microsecond. You will have to zoom out, f look at something that would clue you in where the problem is, zoom in, and keep doing it back and forth. That's hard. Uh, ideally, you want the interesting things to just jump out at you. So my solution is intrusive, meaning I have to instrument the program to collect the data. Uh, so interesting events could be start of a function call, end of a function call, acquiring logs, sending message or I.O., how long did it take, what was going on while that was happening. Now, we, we're going to collect the timeline which would solve our problem of performance. Unfortunately, it may create other problems along the way. Well, programs are kind of uh, quantum things. Uh, measurement affects the results. Uh, <clears throat> so more measurements, especially synchronization, syn disturbs the program. If you introduce additional locks, uh, it will partly serialize your threads, uh, which means uh, your program will not uh, be performing the same way as it normally performs, so your measurements will be skewed. Well, uh, if we try to not introduce additional logs, we risk data races because we're collecting data from multiple threads at the same time. And even if we are pretty confident about what the interesting things are, still we may have to collect a lot of data. Program runs for a long time. Uh, you, you may, you know, if you're collecting even like once every millisecond uh, for 10 hours, well, that's a lot of data. Uh, uh, all of the data ultimately goes to disk, so I.O. can be a problem. Well, okay, let's see in, first, kind of, I'll do a preview. In general, how am I going to solve the problem? There is some amount of work I have to inject onto your real computing threads, the threads that do the actual work. Can't be helped. It has to be minimized. Both the, compu the extra computing I add on your computing threads and the extra locking I add on your computing threads has to be minimized. I may have to do additional processing because uh, my profiling requ you know, requires some amount of work done. If I don't want to put it on your compute threads, where does it go? I have to run separate threads. Now, that means that I'll be taking cores away from the main program. That's actually not bad. That's better than injecting work into compute uh, threads. Why? Well, because let's say I have a 16-core system, for example, I can reserve three cores for the profiler, so now I'm running on a 13-core system. Okay, I, I can limit my program to 13 cores. It's still, uh, you know, it would give me legitimate answers about how well my program performs on 13 cores. Probably about the same. If, if there is a problem on 13 cores, it's probably the same on 16 cores. Uh, I want to reduce the memory footprint of the profiling. That's another thing, because uh, we, we may be already mem uh, memory bound. Finally, I.O. has to run on separate threads. So the workflow would look sort of, sort of like this. These are my work threads. I have to inject a little bit of work into them to, to collect the data for the measurement. But then I'll send this data to one or more separate processing threads, and eventually uh, one of these threads will save it to disk. Okay. Uh, in order to figure out 
what uh, work I have to do on the computer as I have to figure out what data I may want to collect. So this is how my timeline would, would look like. My first thread was doing this task called f function f1 with the argument of one. Second, then it called it f1 with two. At the same time, another thread called f1 with three and hit a lock. Uh, so this is something like uh, what I want to see. Uh, so this real time is on the horizontal axis, which means I have to collect real time. I would usually want to know how busy the CPU was during this time. So I'm, I'll probably want to collect CPU time as well. Uh, and I may want to collect CPU time per thread. That's usually useful. Uh, how busy the CPU was on this thread. If it's some large task, uh, for, I, I may want to collect CPU time per process. That helps me to quickly zoom in on relevant parts. Okay, I have 10 stages in my computation. Uh, I'm running on eight cores. The first one was CPU load was 7.9x. Uh, uh, okay, probably doing good. Second one was 4x. So let's see. The third one was CPU load was 1x for the whole thing for the entire process. That's problem. Uh, so I may need to collect CPU load per process. See these one, two, three. That's user data. May need to collect that. Uh, for some forms of profiling, stack trace may be interesting. Could be other things. Oh, while it's calling F1, oh, F1 may be big. So how it, what was exactly it doing inside F1? Well, it called G1. And this one called G1 and G2. So I may have these nested measurements, in which case I need to know how deeply I am nested. Uh, it, it, you always want to collect only what you need because uh, it's expensive. So we want to minimize the work. We want to collect efficiently. We want to collect only what's necessary. But we also want to make it simple, bad enough that it has to be intrusive. Uh, so here is uh, the simplest way. We can stick these data collection objects. Uh, you'll see how my code actually looks like. I have a macro that does this. Uh, but basically, we will measure, essentially, each, each of these bars on the timeline will be the lifetime of one of these objects. So here, I have an object that lives for the entire duration of the call of F1, which means the constructor starts the measurement and the destructor uh, finishes the measurement. And if I want the nested measurement, I call uh, G1. Inside, there is another data collector. So that will be a nested measurement here. Of course, can be in any scope. Doesn't have to be a function. So uh, we probably always need real time. We need the task ID that F1, we need to know what it was doing, so some form of task ID. Thread ID, so we can, this allows us to draw the timeline. Almost always we want, if, if we have any nesting, we want the nesting depth. CPU time per thread, almost always useful. In some cases, CPU time per process, maybe user data stack trace. So yeah, we need more than one collection, uh, data collection class. I'll be showing you only one for simplicity. Now, where does it all go? So I'm collecting this data. Where does the data go? Where would you put the data that you collect? Where? In memory. In memory, yes. Has to be stored in memory. Did anybody say memory? <coughs> memory has to be allocated, which means overhead and needs to be synchronized. Did anyone say stored? Stored means data races that, again, it means synchronization. How are we going to deal with that? Well, plus there are all these other things, how to collect real time, nesting depth, and so on, CPU time. Let's just quickly go through the CPU time and real time. Linux provides us with uh, these high resolution timers. We can wrap them into a class, uh, a very easy, pretty high resolution. Thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> 50 to 150 nanoseconds on, on modern CPUs. OK, so we can measure time, no problem. Memory allocation, what do we want? Has to be thread safe, has to be low overhead, has to have minimally disruptive synchronization. What does everybody else want? Same thing. Use your own heap. Well, use your own heap, sure. Uh, uh, but again, everybody else wants the same thing. So uh, why can we do better than any other heap out there? Well, we actually have a pretty special case. We don't need a general allocation pattern. We, our allocation pattern is pretty specialized. 
when the work thread starts doing one of these tasks for which we want to generate a time bar, a bar, we need to allocate some memory. When the measurement is done, we will finish using that memory, and we never want to see it again. Sorry? Stack-based? Uh, no, uh, but uh, something pretty similar. Now, furthermore, as I said, the work threads never want to see that memory again, which means whoever cleans it up is, has full control of the time of the cleanup. Okay, it's basically a memory pool, which is kind of similar to stack, only it's, it's, it's not stack, but similar idea. So what's a memory pool? Conceptually, contiguous region of memory with an offset, which tells you what's used, what's not used. Allocation from the memory pool is very simple. You increment the current top of the pool and uh, grab the memory between the old location and the new location of the top, and that memory is yours, and you write stuff into it. Uh, anybody sees any problems on this side in the context that we're going to use it in? Why wouldn't this work? It's not aligned. Well, let's assume that uh, I, I, I'll, I'll make increments aligned. Uh, still doesn't work. I have more than one thread. Not fitting top atomically. Okay, uh, so uh, the comment was updating top atomically. You jumped a little more. The reason this does, doesn't work as written is because it's not thread safe. You can use one per thread. Fortunately, thread safe pool, well, you can use one per thread too. Uh, but fortunately, thread safe memory pool is just as simple. All we need is some form of atomic increment. Uh, atomic increment, well, either returns the old value or returns a new value, depends on which atomic increment you're using. Uh, doesn't matter if you get the old value, if you get the new value, subtract, subtract you int increment again. So atomically increment the top, now that section between the old top and the new top is yours. Only you see it. Only the thread that did that atomic increment can access that allocated section over here. There is no, there is no racing for writing into it because other threads cannot get to it. So it's very simple. So let's say this is what we want to store in memory. Depth, thread IDs, the tag that gives us that user identifier, start time, stop time, CPU time. <clears throat> so that's the struct that we want to show into memory. Well, here is our collector class. It will have a pointer to the task. Uh, and it will have the timer inside. And it will have the depth that counts. What does the depth count? Well, it's the depth of these, of these timeline bars, which basically means how many collectors we currently have alive on the current thread. Because remember, we're measuring the lifetime of the collector object. So we created collector object in the outer scope. It's alive. In the inner scope, we created another collector object. Now we have a nested uh, measurement. So we just need to know how many collector objects are alive on the current thread. Well, uh, ignoring depth, as of, uh, so forget about depth for a moment. When we construct this collector object, we're going to allocate from the pool, and that's where atomic increment goes, and now we own this memory as long as we want to, because no other thread can get to it. So with no fear of races, we're going to construct the task object in the memory we just allocated. This is just user's placement new. And in the destructor, with no fear of races again, we're going to write the, stopped, uh, the final real time and the CPU time. Um, and we're going to count the depth, uh, increment the depth, and decrement the depth. Uh, where does the, what's that depth? How do we count the depth per thread? TLS. Yeah, okay, okay, the question was the TLS. Uh, so, well, everybody knows everything. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, if you had only one thread, you would have a static. And because you have only one thread, you would count the lifetime of these objects with no fear of races. If you have two threads, you need one static per thread, which is TLS. In GCC, you, can, you have this attribute under under thread. In pthread system, you have pthread get specific. Uh, take your choice. Uh, there, uh, <clears throat> so if depth is thread specific, then we never fear races for depth because on one thread, we're only constructing one object at a time. On one thread, you can have multiple objects nesting, but only one is being constructed or destructed. So no races within one thread. OK, so that's, that was easy. And basically, we're half done. I'm a little over half time, but we're half done. As far as the work threads see, the, the, the universe 
is created. At the beginning of the measurement, we allocate some memory, store some stuff. At the end of the measurement, we store more stuff, and we never want to see that memory again. Well, that would be great. Somebody else has to see that memory again, if for no other reason than to deallocate it. And that's the runtime system, the profiler. It's a, you know, the runtime system we create for the profiler. So how does the profiler see the same memory pool? Well, your threads called this empty, your work threads called this empty, allocated, this is where they put their data in, and uh, this uh, was, uh, they called it uh, basically uh, <clears throat> done. Your, profi your profiler has the other view. It sees this is ready, this, do this doesn't mutate anymore. This is where all your work threads are write writing something into it, so this is in flux and this hasn't been used yet. This is what the profiler sees. Profiler has to release the memory. Now, also, I said the memory pool is conceptually one contiguous long region of memory. Notice that word conceptually. Where would you get one contiguous long region of memory? Somebody has to provide it. It would be easy if we had infinite memory. We wouldn't have to deallocate and we wouldn't have to grow the pool. Well, we don't have infinite memory. How much memory do we really have? Well, how much memory do you have on your, on your machine? Four gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, half a terabyte if you're lucky, one or two terabytes on a really big machine. But that's not the final answer. How much memory do you really have? Virtual memory. 64-bit address space, 200 to, to 64 bytes, that's a lot of memory. Do you really have that much memory? No. No. How much memory do you really have? Well, on x86, it's actually 48 bits. Uh, one bit is reserved to the kernel. It's actually 47 bits. Okay, but it's still, how much? It's 128 terabytes of addressable memory. That's a lot. How, it, it's close enough for infinite for many practical purposes, if you could only use it. Well, how do you use it? The same way you do now. You already use it. You just can't use all of it at the same time. So basically, the rest of the talk will be playing games with uh, infinite memory. Uh, for those who, do, uh, anybody here does not know how, me how virtual memory works, just so I know how quickly I can go through these slides. Uh, it, it, I have explanations, so any, anybody needs an explanation for virtual memory? Right, raise your hand and I'll go through it. No? Okay. So let's, let's go a little faster. So what, your process has logical memory, it somehow gets mapped onto physical memory along with everybody else's memory. Did I say mapped? I did. What's that mapping thing? Well, that's the correspondence between physical memory and virtual memory. Uh, so it's done with a granularity of one page on Linux, typically 4K. Don't hard code this number into your program. Operating system uh, has this thing called page table, uh, and uh, it gets some help from the hardware that we're not going to go into. But what it does, it maps the process ID and logical page to physical page. Conceptually, it looks like this. Your multiple processes have their own pages. Each process has conceptually an array of uh, indexed by the logical page, which points to the uh, given physical page. That's not how it's really done. Uh, note that uh, physical pages can be in any order, can, don't have to be contiguous. Uh, oh, note also that some entries in the page table don't point to any physical pages. So what can the, the, the entries in physical in, in the page table point to. Physical page, including shared memory, swap page, and another disk page, and nothing. Now, I said it's conceptual, because in reality, page table is much more efficient than that. All right, uh, most of the address space actually maps to nothing. Nothing is very important. You have 128 terabytes of address space. You probably don't use most of it, which means most of your page table maps to nothing. Uh, page tables, by necessity, have to be particularly good at mapping things to nothing. They are. Since we're going to be playing with memory maps, uh, how much control do we have over the memory map? 
Well, first thing is how do I map a logical page to the physical page? Very simple. You do it every day. You do it every microsecond of every day. You touch the page. If you write or read into the page, physical page materializes. Into, so you write or read into logical page the first time, physical page materializes, it's zero field. Well, if it's zero field, why do we have uninitialized variables? Because usually you get your pages from malloc. You, didn't, you weren't the one who first touched it. Malloc was. Uh, malloc can recycle the pages, put some garbage into the pages, uh, other stuff. OK, how do you reverse that process? Well, there is that system call. On Linux, uh, mAdvise uh, <coughs> uh, give you the range. And what do you want to do with it? This is a constant defined in one of the include files. This will cause the mapping to be erased. But <coughs> uh, oh, by the way, uh, if uh, page size keeps coming up every time. As I said, don't hard code 4K. This, 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 this gives you the page size. OK, don't do this on the page you get from malloc. Malloc doesn't expect you to <coughs> blow away its, its page mappings. It may want to store something in that page after you released it. Uh, if you want to map it not just to physical memory but to disk, there is the same map call. has a lot of arguments. Look up the man page. The interesting ones are length and the file descriptor. And that's how you map it to that file. So what would it do if you mapped it to that file? Well, here is what it would do. Logical pages get mapped to disk pages. And for the ones that you actually touch, there are real physical pages created. For the ones that you don't touch, there aren't. Again, if you uh, typically you create, uh, like you have 128 terabytes of logical space, you probably aren't going to use that all even on disk. Uh, the result will be what's called sparse file, a file whose length is uh, whose size, if you ask for uh, what's the file size, will be 128 terabytes. What's the actual use space? Much less. Uh, little trick the file systems support. Most of them. Anybody here uses Andrew file system? No? OK, you're lucky. Anybody, anybody here from IBM? Be careful with, with, with sparse file systems. Yes, I know. Uh, <clears throat> my hat off to you then. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so uh, the important part is, even if you have virtual address space reserved, it's not real until you use it. If you don't have physical pages mapped, it doesn't count as used memory. If you do top or PS, you will see virtual size of 128 terabytes, if that's how much you reserved, are a resident set, whatever you actually used. Uh, if, you res if you call uh, M that M advice call that I've shown you before to release pages on disk, what will happen is the disk content stays, but the physical page goes away. All right, so now here is our simple memory pool with disk support. This is the same allocate call that we have seen before. This is what the work threads see. And there is some kind of flush that needs to flush it all to disk and release physical pages. This is what our profiler sees. Oh, sorry. How did that happen? OK. What should profiler do? Well, profiler should figure out what memory is not needed. It should. Uh, then uh, flush it to disk and then release it page by page. Uh, just you know, a few days in close proximity of razor blades and it should all be done <laughs> because the easy way can't possibly work. This is log-free programming, people. It has to be hard. <laughs> Anybody wants to know what the easy way was, the one that can't possibly work? Who wants to know what the easy way is? Okay, easy way. What would happen? if we flushed the entire memory pool. What would happen if we flushed the entire memory pool? 
Uh, you block, that's okay, because this is on the profiler thread, so yeah, it starts doing IO, it blocks, that's fine. What else? Sorry? Uh, yes, so s some pages would be dirty, they would be, be uh, read right back in. Well, so th this is basically all the things that would happen. If you have memory pages that are not, haven't been flushed to disk, they will be flushed to disk. Sometimes you may need a call msync for that, and that's what I will actually block. MAdvise may or may not uh, do it. Uh, um, uh, the standard way is to call msync. Uh, spend some time with man pages to, to learn all the details. Physical mappings will be erased. The address space re will remain reserved, but it won't have any physical uh, pages backing. <coughs> if your program, including your work threads, keeps accessing that logical space, which it does, because next, next time it will write some, uh, all allocate a bit more and keep writing its real time and CPU time, that page is created and populated with the content of disk. This actually does exactly what you need it to do. The only question is how much does it cost you? Okay, who here thinks that this solution is practically viable? The cost would be sufficient. Who thinks that there is no way this solution can, it would be too expensive? Both of you are wrong. <laughs> What's the correct, who knows the correct answer? You do. You do. I do, who else? <laughs> What's the correct answer? What's the correct answer to any performance question? Depends. Measure. Yes. This is the correct answer to every performance question. Measure it. Okay, well to measure we have to write something. What do we write? We write a simple flush thread that once a second, uh, oops, uh, I'm sorry, this inst instead of discard, it should be flush. I renamed the function while working on the slides. Uh, this says flush. Uh, <clears throat> it's spelled discard, but it actually reads flush. Uh, so once a second, and a second is just some arbitrary time, could, uh, and yeah, in a practical program, you don't use sleep, you use nano sleep. Nano sleep didn't fit on the slide because it takes long arguments. Um, so once a second, we would erase all physical mapping and flash all memory that has been changed to disk. Not we don't, we don't even bother to figure out which ones we already flashed, which ones we didn't flash. We're flashing the whole thing. It, uh, and the work threads, and we keep doing that until the work threads are done. And we have some atomic count that, atomic flag, I'm sorry, that tells us when the work threads are done and we need to finish. Okay. Here is my measurement. So, so this is the actual practical result. 32 threads running on 32 cores. Without significant, which means without observable disruption of the, of the program being profiled, the sustained rate of events is about one event per 100 microseconds on each thread. If there are more than 32 threads, we have to throttle it down a bit. But peak rate can spike much higher as long as it's not for long. This testifies to the, to the fact that the page table is incredibly efficient because I am unmapping a whole bunch of nothing on every call to this range and page table does it very well. It's some sort of tree actually if the, if the whole, it divides the range so if, if a node, if a parent node map shows nothing that means all the children are all nothing and it doesn't go in. So this simple disk pool is actually sufficient for most practical purposes. Well, what happens when it fills up? That's the hard part. Again, it has the easy answer, you die. Practical result, that's how I did it. I ran it for 12 to 24 hours. I haven't had the program terminate due to that yet. Partially, why not? What would I do with several terabytes worth of data if it terminated? I can't read that much. Well, uh, the harder way is you either roll over or you freeze the entire system and you swap in another memory segment. It's a very rare event. Just one question, I'm not clear. Are you flushing the entire memory pool or just the part that the threads have already released? I'm flushing the entire memory pool. The page table looks and says, okay, this has never been allocated, ignoring that. This has already been flushed, never mind that. This is the one that has been dirtied since the last flush, let me flush that. 
And what impact does, does that have on the threads? What are they able to? The, a few, few more page faults would be, so uh, several more page faults would be generated because when the thread hits the page that I just flashed, it, it, every time it triggers a page fault. That's the impact. Uh, it turned out not to be that much. Again, it boils down to the rate that you can sustain. One page fault every 100 microsecond, not too bad. You probably have more for other reasons. Uh, uh, if you had to do it every nanosecond, that would be bad. OK, let me just show you basically the, how it, the annotations look like in my code. Uh, so I have this uh, thread scope timed process, uh, which take and various parameters. And this uh, uh, create measurement. This, inside this macro creates an object. Again, every time I measure the lifetime of the object. And the same thing is for task. Process measures the per process time. Task measures per thread time. Uh, uh, task is a little bit more lightweight. Lock is the only one where I can't do it with a lifetime of an object. Why? Because I have this lock guard here or scoped lock. And if I wrap the scope around it, the scoped lock will go out of scope right there. I actually want this, the, to measure how long I waited on the lock from the time I asked for it to the time I got it. But the scope cannot end here. So this is the only one where I have to use two macros. Uh, some things don't even need a duration. I may just want to have a single tick on the timeline. This is where something happened. So I have an event. This is, uh, or a pending event. Event means constructor puts the tick. Pending event means destructor puts the tick. You can do other things. OK. I don't, I'm, I have no experience in writing UIs. I did, I did it the lazy way out. I converted the data to CSS HTML. And Chrome was the UI. So this is, this is the actual screenshot uh, from the UI. Time. Thread ID, each bar is a record of something. I have nested records, so while it was doing this big task, it was doing these smaller tasks inside. Uh, all the user data shows up as pop-ups on, on, on mouse over. At the top, I have the heartbeat collecting aggregate CPU and memory utilization. Why not? I have another thread, runs in background, wakes up every second, measures CPU time. Here is an interesting bit. This, this whole stuff is being flushed to disk once a second. I can read it from disk while the program is still running. I have to live with the fact that some of my data will not be finished. So I have to, like, I may get like zero real time because real time hasn't been written yet. I have to discard that, that somehow. If I figure out how to do that, I can visualize this data while the program is running for the portion that already been collected. OK, we have a little bit of time. I can, I can show you how to do things if you really want to do things the hard way, and I can answer questions. Okay, so do you have questions on what I said before? Yes? Is this available somewhere? Unfortunately, no. I did, so I would have to pull it out of our code base, which is doable. Uh, and in order for it to be kind of a practical use, it would need to be you know, test it on more platforms than, uh, uh, than, than what we have. Speaking of which, is there Windows support? I don't see, I, I never developed on Windows. I, you know, not only I don't develop now, I actually never developed anything on Windows. So I don't even know if there is MMAP there. There is some there. So uh, somebody, if, if you want to do a Windows port, uh, you know, uh, come talk to me. We, we, we can talk it over. As I said, I can pull it out of, the, of our code base and isolate it and uh, make it like, devoid of any proprietary content. Uh, but I don't know actually anything about uh, Windows. I don't, you know, MMAP, uh, MAdvise, I don't know if it's there or not. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, are there things you can measure using this infrastructure that you can't with VTune, for example? Well, uh, that's uh, so. F well, f so f there is a trivial answer. Yes, I can, for example, collect my actual user data you know, on this time bar. So, for example, I say th this is the, the, so Vtune will say you know this is like this line of code, you know, profiler like profiler for this line of code, or like this is this function, 
and the function took from here to here. I can add, this is this function with parameters one, two, and three. And the next event on the same function is the same function with five, six, seven. So I can collect you know, arbitrary user data. That's one. The other is kind of more subjective. Uh, if you, you know, if you let Vitune collect everything it can, it becomes slower and it, it's hard to figure out what you're looking for. If you don't, you may miss what, what you're really looking for. So that's kind of subjective between, you know, instrumented, uh, in, invasive versus automatic. So there are some things that you cannot do and then the rest depends on what you consider more useful and what your habits uh, are, what's easier for you to work on. Yes? Uh, instead of having each record store the thread ID, uh, could you have used thread local storage to have one pool per thread and then uh, avoid having to do an atomic increment? Uh, you probably can. You would have multiple files so, so uh, which would all be synced. So uh, somewhere you know, inside the bubbles of the OS, there would be some synchronizations going on because you actually don't have that much bandwidth to disk. So th they would have to throttle each other. Uh, uh, it would have, again, it would have to be measured. You would have a bit less control over who throttles whom and when. Uh, it would have to be measured. Yes, uh, questions? Okay, we have just a few minutes. Well, should we see the hard way? Okay, let's see the hard way. Now, uh, we don't do the hard way just because we want to like to doing things the hard way. Well, sometimes we don't. Uh, sometimes we do just for the heck of it. But let's consider a practical example. I want to collect stack traces. Stack traces actually require a lot of processing. You have to collect stack trace on the work thread because the stack, the bare minimum. And what's the bare minimum for the stack trace? It's just an array of <laughs> stack pointers. But stack traces, for example, let's say I want to collect stack trace of every memory allocation. That's too much data. You can't flush that much data to disk. Uh, well, even if you could, you would basically run out of disk space. That's a lot of data. So what you probably want to do is aggregate how many allocations I had for each stack trace. So now you have some sort of hash lookup or some other associative lookup. Did I see the stack trace before? How many uh, allocations I had already? Add one, something like that. That's expensive. You move that to another thread. So your work threads generate events into a pool that is not backed by disk because we're, disk cannot keep up with that. You have one processing thread that sweeps the pool, pulls the data out, does the processing, uh, releases the memory, and writes it into another pool. That could be the disk pool. And then you have a flush thread that releases the memory. Anonymous memory pool, the same as disk pool, only without a file. And if you release the memory page, it's actually gone. Okay, so this is our stack trace uh, count and uh, pointers. And uh, the processing thread sweeps the, uh, basically the pool that is, the memory pool is basically one of these tracks after another. The, you just keep adding them into, the, into your memory pool. The processing thread keeps taking them off. Data races, how do you avoid data races? You make this for, for you, you, have a, you, you need to have a flag. For example, this count could be atomic. If it's zero, it's not ready yet. Haven't finished collecting stack trace. As soon as it becomes non-zero, we're done. The processing thread can take it off. So this is what it looks like. Work thread keeps shoving stack traces in here. We have the sweep thread that has a pointer. Uh, it moves the pointer forward one track of the other. As soon as it hits the struct that hasn't been finalized, this count is zero. It stops and waits for a while. Uh, and uh, if it hits the <coughs> struct with the count non-zero, it the, discards the memory page. It writes the accumulated data into another memory pool. This is, this is the disk pool that we have seen before. It's being flushed to disk. Okay, one to do things. Even harder way, what if 
one thread cannot keep up. You use two threads. How do you use two threads? Well, one of two ways. You can run actually two sweeper threads at the same time. Now you have tricky synchronization problems. The easier way is to do a pipeline. The sweeper does half of the necessary processing, writes it into another memory pool, second sweeper sweeps that, does the other half. In case of stack traces, there is, a, for example, a natural separation. One, of the, one thread counts stack traces, the other one adds symbols to the stack traces. That's how I have done it. And that's the last slide. Uh, so, yeah, the hard way actually is harder, so if you want details, you can, you can talk to me after the session. But what, we, what have we seen? We have seen, hopefully, some idea about how to measure performance of concurrent program, how to rip data out of multiple threads with very little contention, very little sharing, very little overhead, and how to create almost infinite memory. More questions? How do you decide where to put your collector objects? It seems like you have to know the pro where the problem lies before, because you're instrumenting the code. Uh, well, yes. So uh, as I said, collector objects instrument interesting events. So what's interesting? Uh, if you don't know anything, your normal profiler would actually be extremely useful. Even, not, even well, Vtune may, may have some timelines. Even like the, the simple profiler, like Google profiler, would tell you this function spends a lot of uh, time and doesn't seem to produce much result. So that's what, you know, you instrument the function and the guts of it. Uh, if you, often your programs have some logs. I, I'm starting the simulation. I, I'm, I've done the simulation. I've, uh, I run on 32 threads, uh, one hour real time, 30, 30 minutes CPU time. Um, probably something is going on uh, wrong there. That's what they're going to instrument. Uh, so basically, uh, short answer is any way you can. Hit <laughs> a breakpoint and see what, what it's doing. Well, that's uh, basically what profilers do. They hit you with uh, P do it, do it manually. Do it uh, that's uh, yeah, you know, running uh, S trace or P trace every uh, periodic. I mean, D trace or P trace. Uh, but that's basically what the profilers do. They hit you with P trace every now and then and, <laughs> and see where you are. <laughs> Other questions? Well, thank you. Oh, question? Okay. Do, do you ship your code with the collectors in it? Uh, I ship it with collectors disabled. Well, uh, so I have two ways of disabling it. I can disable it at compile time because they're all macros, and that's actually one of the reasons they're all macros. Uh, and I can enable some compilation, some, so normal, the, the very production version, you know, the one that goes out generically, I ship with collectors disabled. If I want to, uh, if, I, if, if, I, if I have a problem somewhere at the customer side, and we, we write software for, for sale, so it, it, it's, it's running at the customer side, I can ship it with macros enabled, but the runtime switch disabled, and then support engineer would, would enable it on specific units and send me back the trace. Well, if there are other questions, then uh, just come talk to me after the session, and thank you very much.